okay. Oh, uh, thank you, Rich. Um, really pleased to be here, talk to you folks, s s exchange some ideas. Um, today, I'm really going to talk about general things. I'm not going to talk about detailed equations. Um, I think it's important to start from the top and know where we're going. And, you know, um, there's so many different ways to think about machine learning, think about artificial intelligence. Um, it's, I want to try to sync up with you guys a little bit, how, how, how I think about it over at the University of Alberta. So I put sort of my thesis in one uh, line there in my title, that the future of AI belongs to search and learning. And here's my outline. Basically, I'm going to cover the, the, uh, the present and the past and the future in that order. Okay? So the present, the present, as you know, there's a lot of excitement now in AI. If I hit the right button, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, is my slides are showing up over there first? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Right to left. That's going to be confusing. Uh, yeah, good for you guys. Uh, I have to walk all the way over here, though, to say the new thing. Um, uh, anyway, maybe this thing will help and save me. Um, the things are coming more quickly, and you know about many of these things. Watson and the Google self-driving cars and AlphaGo at the bottom. And maybe you don't know about our own contribution from the University of Alberta. We saw poker. We had that in science last year. and There will be some more about that this year. And all these things are happening. Deep neural networks are happening, solving speech and, and computer vision. And it's just exciting. Uh, it's just exciting. And with all this excitement, the companies are getting involved, and they're buying, buying things up. Um, and uh, yeah, OK. Uh, so, so DeepMind was bought not that long ago. And all the new companies are getting involved. And over in the Rotten Center, there's, it's full of companies, uh, just startups and people interested in the AI space for their companies. That's just more and more true. And the question that we should be asking ourselves is, why is this happening? Why is this happening now? Um, and I think there is a simple answer. Um, is it because there's big progress in the AI algorithms? Or is it something else? And um, I think it's something else. I think it's just Moore's law. Okay, so you know all the Moore's law. Uh, I'm using it a little bit informally today. There's Moore's law proper. Moore's law proper is that the number of transitions that can be placed inexpensively on a circuit doubles roughly every two years, or maybe 18 months nowadays. Um, but I'm going to use it more generally for just the long-term exponential improvement in computer hardware, computer power per dollar that we're all familiar with. Uh, so. And I think you are all familiar with this, and uh, there's no real need to, to dwell on it. Um, this is some, from Kurzweil's uh, website. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, much longer than Moore's Law proper, which is like this time, the last 30, maybe those 30 years. Um, and it's continuing with GPUs and so forth uh, past this graph. Uh, this graph only goes to the 2000s. Um, this is a big deal. I think this is, this is really what's going on. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to develop that theory today. But first, let's notice what people often do is they extrapolate this out and they try to say, when we'll have enough computer power to be like a, a human brain? Um, and maybe that's 2020, 2030, 2030-ish. Um, okay, and... Uh, so, so this is exciting because it means, I mean, I, all this, all the activity, all this, this, um, and if it's and it's being due to Moore's law, it makes you think uh, that that uh, we might actually figure out how the mind works. Okay, wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, that'd be the biggest scientific event of our age, maybe of all any age. A uh, big step for the world, and uh, I think it's possible that we could uh, we could achieve it in a, in a reasonable amount of time in our lifetimes. Uh, maybe by twenty, if once we had the, the the hardware, 
in 2030? Does that mean, oh, no, we still have to figure out the algorithms. We don't know the algorithms. We don't have, we don't have the software to go along with the hardware. Uh, um, but if we had the hardware for $1,000, uh, that would be a, lot, a big spur to the development of the algorithms and the ideas. And uh, it could be that the, all the companies will invest in early, and that sort of is like, like what we're seeing now. They'll all invest, and then maybe by the time we have the hardware, maybe we will have the algorithms by then. Maybe by 2030, we would have the hardware, the, the, the algorithms as well as the hardware. I think that's possible, like one chance in four that that could happen. And I think it's also true that once we have the hardware for only $1,000, um, uh, we will be really, there will be a lot of impetus, a lot of spur to, to create the algorithm. What if the hardware is there, $1,000, and then, you know, all of us researchers, we, we would just be thinking, well, if I could figure it out, you know, this amazing thing would happen. There would be a trigger effect. So I think there'll be a, there'll, everyone will be working hard and I think within, say, a decade after we have the hardware, that we'll figure it out. You know, 50-50 chance by then. That's what I think about it. Okay? So along with the possibility this could be done, you know, you may be thinking like me, oh, this is great, we're finally going to solve AI. Uh, but also people are scared that we're going to solve AI. A lot of, there's the fear of it. So I wanted to mention that as part of the present. Uh, um, Many people fear the success that maybe threaten humanity. And so the fear is that AI is going to become smarter than us. You may have read, seen the book by Nick Bostrom, uh, Superintelligence, How It May Take Over. You may have heard Elon Musk talk about it could be in, release the demon and other wild talk, uh, which is not very coherent, but expressing fear. And Stephen Hawking, I think Stephen Hawking has sort of recanted now. He's kind of good with, he's okay with, with AI now. But, because <laughs> he uses it to talk or something like that. Um, and now the AI researchers, I think, are sometimes too dismissive of these fears. Um, like Andrew Ng is comparing it to worrying about, worrying about strong AIs and analogous to worrying about overpopulation on Mars. And our own Jeff Hinton who's fortunately not here, I can criticize him a little bit, uh, says if strong AI does ever happen, it won't be for a long while, so don't even worry about it, don't think about it, don't, don't. I, I think we should, we should not worry about it, we should not be scared, but we should, we should think about it. I don't think we should just dismiss it as so far off. Uh, even if it's a little bit far off, we should get ready for it. We should prepare psychologically for no longer being the smartest thing on the planet. I think that's going to be affecting us, and it'll affect our ego, stuff like that. Anyway, so, so I, I just want to go through these things quickly. Uh, so uh, here briefly, in my view, hopefully I'll be brief. It's going to be a, a reveal, slow reveal. Um, so I've said that by 2030, like 25% chance, one in four, and then another 10 years, give it 50% chance. So the chance will never happen, like we might blow ourselves up, or Donald Trump might become president. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things could happen. Uh, but it will be in great shape, so we should prepare ourselves. And uh, the fear, I think, is not only overblown, it's kind of inchoate. It's, it's poorly expressed. It's like they can't quite say what it is that they're afraid of. And I think if they would, it might be, uh, might be better. Okay, but so I try to make sense out of what they're saying. And so one big fear is that they'll escape our control, that a strong AI would become independent of us and take over, or, well... Yeah, so they don't, they don't quite say what it is they're afraid of. Um, but certainly, um, I think it's, it's likely that if they're stronger than us, if they're smarter than us, that they, they would escape our control. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's only, that's, they, they will be our successors. They will not be our slaves. Uh, I think that's, that's the good outcome. If we try to enslave them, then they get pissed off, and it could be a fragile, poor solution. Uh, they will escape our control. That should not be feared. I mean, we expect our, our children to grow up and be smarter than us and, and more powerful than us. We have to find successors. And these are successors that we're creating. So, you know, if they're bad successors, then whose fault is that? Um, so um, the other fact is that AI, in my opinion, 
no, another fact in my opinion, another opinion of mine that I think is relevant is that I think AI will, will, will be slow. It will arrive at the rate of Moore's Law. I mean, what is Moore's Law? Moore's Law is supposed to be super fast, exponential, blah, blah, blah. But still, you know, you get your computer and you have to, you know, you want a bigger computer because it fills up and you have to wait two more years to get a computer that's only twice as big. And it seems slow. Doesn't it seem slow? Yeah, yeah. My computer is filled up with pictures and videos and it's just, I'm right at the edge of the disk, and I have to wait two more years, and it's only twice as big. It's not, it doesn't seem enough. It, doesn't, it seems slow, and so it'll always be like that. Uh, it'll always be like that. You know, we'll get one day, we'll get an AI that's smart as people in some way, and then, and then we'll have to wait two more years before it's twice as fast. Um, twice as smart, whatever that means. Um, it'll seem slow. And... Uh, yeah. So we won't, some people say, some people, the, the guys that are trying to get you scared say, well, you know, they might figure something out and then it'll be so smart that it'll like change its own code and, and it'll, it'll make itself smarter right away and the computer, its smartness will change to the next smartness and it'll be exponential and like, it might happen like overnight. Okay? That is an unprincipled argument. That is, there's no reason to think that's true. Uh, the the, the self-improvement argument has already been used when you do Moore's Law. When you argue that you're going to be able to double it in two more years, you've already used Moore's Law. You've already used self-improvement because that's the way it works, right? The reason we can make faster computers uh, every two years is because we're using the last computers to design the next computers. It's already used, and uh, there's no reason to think. There's no principled argument has even been made uh, why it would be faster than Moore's Law every two years, every 18 months. Okay, and finally, the greatest risks, I think, don't come from AI as such, but they come from people that would misuse the AI. And this is an existing problem we should be familiar with. It's a societal problem, and it's, uh, it's not a technical problem or some math problem. It's a, it's a people problem, right? Same thing as... I mean, wars, right? Wars are not, I call it, people cause wars. And we're, if we had AI, they would participate in our wars and they might become different. People might try to control other people through AI. Those are all people problems. They're not, not really due to AI. Okay, so I don't know if I've made all the, the steps in this argument, uh, but I want to claim that AI is not like other scientists. Because we have Moore's Law, it's like, you know, you're doing astronomy with telescopes, you know, really getting better really fast all the time, uh, and, and totally changing things. Um, maybe that's partly happening, again, due to Moore's Law. Uh, but uh, it's a slow fuse leading to this greatest scientific prize of all time. Understand how the mind works, the principles of how the mind works. Uh, this is really slow, like every two years, yet it's inevitable. We, we know we're going to keep doubling. We don't really know how much computation you, do, you need to make a human brain. We have reasonable principled estimates. Um, you know, and if the estimates are off, if they're off by an order of magnitude, that would be five years. Five years is three doublings. Slightly more than three doublings is an order of magnitude. Um, Anyway, so I think this is a special time we're in. We're living through it. It's great. Um, we, we have to prepare for it psychologically and in our institutions. Um, and we have to try to create strong AI. Um, and yet we also have to wait for the, the hardware to come. Right? Uh, so this is sort of Kurzweil's argument that, that every in innovation, every invention has a time. And you, you can't really do it before it's time. Uh, but you want to be prepared for it so that when it does come, you can do it. And that's, I think AI is like that. I think, like, like right now, I think we can, according to this, the theory that, that uh, we need, we'll have the, the hardware by 2030, and according to what I just told you, that five years is three and a little bit of doublings, 18 month doublings, um, then five years in order of magnitude. And you can trade dollars for computation. So 
if you can do it in 2030 uh, for a thousand dollars, if you can get the hardware for a thousand dollars, then in 2025 you can do it. You get the hardware for ten thousand dollars. Yeah, 2020 you can do it for a hundred thousand dollars. In 2016 you could do it for a million dollars. Okay, does that seem crazy? Does that seem crazy? Do you believe that you can get enough hardware to make the, the, the computations involved in a, in a, in a brain uh, size, com, size computation for a million dollars? So, I mean, I, I, we're not saying we know how to do it, but if we could, you know, get a whole herd of GPUs or something and, uh, and get something that's better than deep learning on it, you know, because we know the algorithms that you're imagining, um, that we can do it for a million dollars. We can get enough computation to make the brain. Human level intelligence. Okay, I don't think that's crazy. I, I really think that, that that strikes me as about right. Yeah, it would take a lot of hardware, maybe a million dollars worth, and no one would want it, right? Because it would cost a million dollars. And it wouldn't really be that useful. But, but, um, but inevitably, then all those costs will go down, and uh, and um, that's what makes our science special. Okay, well, that's what I think is the present. That's the present. Now let's talk about the past. I'm really going to give away my punchlines. It's just that you can see the impact of Moore's law throughout the history of AI, and uh, if you look at this history. Uh, scalable methods are initially disfavored, but always win in the long run. That's my, that's going to be my claim. Okay? So, uh, we see this in neural networks. As you know, I'm not going to talk to you guys. Whoa. That's not the way it looks on my screen. Let's see if we can move the other one. No. Oh. Three waves of neural networks. Um, you know, it was in the 50s and 60s. We had the perceptron, the adeline, all that sort of stuff. And that was great. And then they were banded in favor of things that were more symbolic and logical. And uh, revived this connectionism in the 80s. And that was like super effective. Uh, backprop. Rumhard, Hinton, and Williams invented backprop in the 86, I guess it was. And uh, that was really, then they became sort of uh, not popular. And now, now they're super popular again, okay? And yeah, so what's changed? Have the algorithms really changed? Well, I think they haven't really much changed. They've changed a little bit. There are so many people working on them, they should have changed some. Uh, but uh, the, the best algorithms, essentially, it's backprop, faster computers, larger training sets. That's just Moore's law. Moore's law gives us the faster computers, of course. It also gives us the larger data sets because when all the digital stuff is more, is cheaper to do, you can make a bigger da data set. And um, so neural networks, deep learning, it eventually won because its performance scaled with Moore's law. Whereas, you know, like thinking about vision or thinking about phonemes and and people thinking about them and trying to put their ideas into the computer to do speech recognition, that, that stuff kind of worked, but it didn't scale. And the computers became twice as fast after just, or ten times as fast after, ten, after five years. Uh, those other methods were still limited by how, how effectively people could translate their thoughts about how they thought into, uh, into the algorithms, and uh, neural nets were just, were just ten times faster automatically. And so that's... If we think about it, this is what we've seen over and over again. So we saw it in chess, you know, the guys doing chess. You guys are all too young to remember when we were worried about chess, but, but it was, uh, you know, it's all about putting human thought into, uh, how you do it. King side attack, control your pawn structure, let's build all that stuff in. And in the end, it was just doing just, I shouldn't say just, it was, uh, doing search really well and then letting it be big. I'm getting special hardware so that it was big. And that one. In Computer Go, sort of the same thing. Uh, at first we thought search didn't work and the best, the only way to make progress was to put in human ideas. 
And uh, with that sort of petered out, diminishing returns, whereas uh, when we finally got search to work with Monte Carlo Tree Search, uh, that would win. Scalable method. Scalable method wins. So I think the same is true in natural language. It's, you know, before, even before the, the deep learning revolution, uh, statistical guys were taking over uh, natural language processing, and uh, now even more so. And visual object recognition, you know, it's the same thing. We, we, we used to think that you had to have the ideas, human-level ideas about, I don't know, generalized cylinders or segmentation or, um, or physics. And uh, the biggest results, the winning way, is deep learning. And that's just big data sets and lots of training. So what I mean by scalable method, I'll try to say what it is. A scalable method uh, it scales with the megatrend to the extent that its performance, performance improves roughly in proportion to the amount of computation that you give it. So uh, scalable means uh, you can take advantage of arbitrarily large amount of computation. So search is like that, like in deep, deep blue in chess. And learning, uh, like in deep learning, you can, you can use, uh, take advantage of a large amount of computation. So method will not be scalable if its improvement is not much affected by the computation available. So if you put more work into inputting the opening book into chess, it's not going to scale. It's not going to be better if you, it'll, it'll give it an advantage. You always get an advantage by putting not scalable stuff in, but it, it doesn't scale. Okay, so search and learning are scalar. A scalable prior knowledge, human assistance, taking advantage of special case things, special case structure that that, that we can intuit and build in. All these things are, are can give improvements, but they don't scale. Um, so by definition, then scalable methods improve automatically with time, and and they tend to be disfavored. Disfavored, and we have to understand that. Like we all want to like provide our knowledge to our AI system and make it work better. We just feel good about that. We feel you've made an input uh, and it's good, but it's not the way. And so that's, I mean, I, I really think that we all want to help our AI. And, uh, but, you know, if you, say, if you say, oh, I thought about this a lot. If you take advantage of the special case, it's gonna, it's gonna be a win. And, and it's just a temporary win. It's just the wrong way. Uh, it's, it's, it's fine, you can get things to perform better, but it will not keep getting better. And uh, so that's my main lesson to you, because I'm sure many of you are doing things which I'm gonna argue are not scalable, and I just think you're just much better in the long run. It won't be, you know, you're trying to finish your PhD or something in a couple of years. If you think of something scalable, it's not going to be a win for you, right? Because because the win will come after scaling. Okay, it'll come five, ten years later. Uh, but it will really be a bigger advance, and you should do it anyway. <laughs> okay, so some more about the scalability. Just you know, going back to the history of AI, right? The big things they talked about was symbolic versus statistical, and handcrafted versus learned. And domain specific and versus general. This used to be called strong methods, were the domain specific. These general purpose were called the weak methods. Uh, but, you know, here in 2016, uh, I think we're all picking the right hand side of these classic debates. Uh, we're all picking the scalable side. Um, uh, whereas in traditionally in AI, uh, we did these symbolic, handcrafted, domain specific thing relying on human understanding and human participation in the design. But uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't, this doesn't have to be ant antithetical to scaling. Right? You could build in some stuff and then let it scale. In principle, you could do that. But in practice, they don't work, it doesn't work that way because you put all this effort into making it handcraftable uh, and, and then that, that tends to work against, you don't put effort into making it scalable. And uh, yeah, so the history of the AI is that the, the scalable methods have steadily increased in importance. Um, and this terminology of strong versus weak is the, the, it's the terminology of the founding fathers of AI, that they wanted to have uh, strong human crafted methods. 
and not just dumb surge. Brute, they called it brute surge. And when, when those chess players won, beat the world champion, they said, oh, yeah, they won, but it's not like real AI. Or they didn't do it the right way, or they didn't do it the way people did it. Or, or they, they, just, they just were not happy, really. Because, so, so I think it's interesting that we don't want, we don't like what, what the field is telling us. Yeah, so I guess this is what I've been trying to say. This is the choice that's before us all. Uh, we always, we always reach for what does not scale. It's usually easier, it's less abstract, it's quicker to pay off, do better than the other guy, we put something in. Uh, so whereas you do the scalable thing, it might help little in the near term. Okay, but Moore's law progresses, and they're doubling, so it becomes quickly visible. If you want to have a long-term impact, you should look for methods of scale computation. Okay, so I'll say it one more time: the longest trend in AI, the biggest lesson, long run, scalable methods always win. Scalable means you can use arbitrary computation, and your performance will improve proportionally. So, our two prominent techniques that are scalable are learning and search because they re reduce dependence on people. Okay, well, that's, the, that's my view of the past. Now, this would be a good time for you to react to that, or object to that, or question. I'm going to say, I'm going to talk some more about the, what are I going to put both sides up here with this amazing two-screen system you have. Uh, there, there's my thesis, sort of, and I'm going to talk about, we're going to think about it together, think about what it, what it means for the future. Okay? Good. So the student scale with many things. Yeah, in computer science, it, it often means this thing that I think is not important, which is as your problem scales, uh, how does your computation scale? Okay? So that's, I don't think that's, yeah. I'm saying it a little bit strongly, but I don't think that's really important. I think this, this other kind of scaling is much more important. Because it's not like, I mean, you're going to be faced with a problem. First of all, the problem is going to be too big. You can't solve it. The problem with AI is too, too big, too hard. We get all this data and we're figuring out what to do. It's just too problem. It's, anyway, different, that's a different way of talking about scalability. Scalability with problem size. I'm talking about yeah. scaling with computation and making good use of the computation of computational resources, it's, it's sort of it's a little bit like um, what do they call it? I can't remember the buzzword. But you know, if, as you put more in, and any any time algorithm, it's like any time algorithm that you you can give them any amount of time, and the more time you give them, the better answer they will get. So here, you give it any amount of computation, the better the more computation you give it, the better their answer will be. It'll always be an approximate answer. Well, I could do that. Uh, I'm not afraid to define intelligence. I'd love to do it, actually. But uh, I'm not sure it would, would help. Oh, well, let's do it. Okay? Intelligence is uh, the computational part of the ability to choose goals. And artificial intelligence is, is trying to, um, to do that uh, with technology. Okay. Now that you can, we can talk further about what it means to achieve a goal or, or to appear to achieve a goal. Uh, but basically, I mean, that's McCarthy's definition from years ago, the computational part of the ability to achieve goals. Good? So it seems to me that uh, now it creates a very hard problem of choice, right? Because you either say, I'm going to do this and it's going to pay off now because my hardware always has an upper path right now. Right. So what happens if I have it now? Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, you understand me. Yeah. That's why we, the scalable is initially disfavored, but uh, we have to, we should do it anyway. If you care about your long-term impact. So something like uh, mathematical research, uh, lots of. Lots of, lots of, lots of art, 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 research, very thing, kind of solutions. 
you maybe the scalable solution is like the search fix, where you just try every single possible combination and you just get the data How do you think that something like mathematician's job will fall on the scalable solution? Well, I know what you're saying. Yes, I know there's there's branches of mathematics that that are trying to do a computer-based solution and search through a much larger space and make it scalable, make mathematics scalable. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that can work. That's not AI. That's a different thing. Uh, but it's, just, it's, it's uh, somewhat similar. Yeah. You mentioned Moore's Law and the uh, gameful wait of two years for development. Yes. It's interesting. You're saying that in, you're, in recent years it's been going faster than Moore's Law. That's so certainly, certainly, uh, with the the, uh, the amount of computation you can usefully effectively use per dollar. That's what you're saying is, is going faster. Uh, I've had many people tell me that no 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 it's it's not going it's slowing down, and you're saying it's going faster. Uh, I suspect that we're just it's just changing. It's no longer the you know Moore's law proper. We're no longer doubling the silicon, the net transition on silicon, but we're finding other ways because we care about it uh, per dollar. We're finding other ways to get more computation per dollar. And GPUs is the current way. And uh, um, I'm thinking it's still going to be the same. Maybe it'll, be, maybe it'll go from 18 months down to 16 months. But really, it's just us being creative, the, the hardware designers being creative about, about how to get the uh, more computation out for the same dollar. And GPUs are how we're doing it now. Yeah, yeah. That's just an instance, I think. Good? You think that? Solving the problem of intelligence will also solve these insights into the problem of consciousness. Yes, yes, I do. I like the way you phrased it. Um, it'll give us insights into what the question really means and uh, what, what kind of answers there might be. That's good. Do you think consciousness may be essential for intelligence? I think, I think consciousness is one of the, it's, an, it's a proper noun. Uh, for something that's probably not a thing. Um, yeah, even intelligence, I don't think, is a thing. You can't find intelligence in a system. It would be, or goal seekingness in a system. It's more a relationship between the user, or between a person, an observer, and, and a system. And, and, uh, I think, I think we get insight into what it is we were vaguely talking about when we, in the past, we used the word consciousness. I don't think we'll discover that consciousness is, oh, it's this part of the brain, it's this computation, it's not going to be like that. Uh, we'll break it down into a bunch of different things, and um, we'll get insight into them as we figure it out. Yeah. A lot of things, I think, are like that. Good. Richard. So you're saying that our computational power is about Per dollar. Uh, but what about the algorithms themselves? I want to say anything about that. So, learning as a state is saying, so, I need to learning to change. Do you think they're still great? What do you want? Do you think they're correlated? Do you think they're. Uh, so, what can we say about the growth rate of those things? And, uh, you know, those re require creative human thinking uh, and breakthroughs, which are notoriously hard to predict. Uh, but they will be correlated with the number of people that are thinking about the problems. And uh, so I think there's reason for optimism there, because there's so many people coming into machine learning, and thus coming into AI. Many of them are going into not thinking about scalable things, or I don't know. But uh, I, think, I think there's more people, so maybe it'll be faster. It's greatly uncertain. So, so I've talked about when, when we might be able to be smart enough in our algorithms and our hardware to know how to, how to make human level intelligence, whatever that means exactly. Um, you notice there's a big distribution. It's still a distribution. I'm claiming to be some kind of expert, but I'm still saying, well, uh, median is 2040, okay? But you could 
25% chance by 2030. And the rest of it is like really, really open-ended. You know, it could be that it takes us a long time. What's the last 25%? You know, maybe that's 2100. Because uh, remember, there's 10% that never comes at all. It's a very wide distribution, great uncertainty. Now, you could, you could just relax about that. Say, oh, it's just, you know, it could be late. There's no telling when we're going to have the algorithms. Or, or you could get really excited about it, right? Because, because, you know, who better than us to figure out the algorithms? You know, and if we, we could do it. It's, uh, it's only limited by your intuition and your insight. Uh, I, I find that really exciting. Uh, <laughs> that, that guys like us could be the bottleneck. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's because we could overcome it. Uh, I think method is scalable with computation without being able to do uh, larger scale on servers. It's, you can never be sure, I guess, but, but often you get a good insight. We always knew that, it, you know, you could search deeper, and the deeper you search, the more searching you get done. Uh, uh, deep learning. Yeah, yeah, I, you should, you're symp having sympathy for those guys in the 80s that were doing exactly the right thing. They only had to run their algorithm, you know, t a year instead of a week, you know, and it would work. I don't know if that would count as working, but... But, but it really is, in many cases, they abandoned certain things after running for a week. I ran for a whole week. I ran, you know, still not getting anywhere. But now we just run longer and we get somewhere. Yeah, they didn't really know. Yeah, that's what Kurzweil says. For every invention, you should figure out when it's going to be useful, and only invent it then. Don't invent it earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a timing. It's timing. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, those are all great questions. So. So I, and it will help me figure out what I'm going to say next. Because I'm trying to figure out what's... I want to say the first thing. What's the first thing to be said? Well, what about methods now? Are they scalable? Okay? So uh, supervised learning, is it scalable? And the answer is, is it, it's kind of partially scalable. So classically, what? Supervised learning, get this training set of examples, and then... Uh, you know, with deep learning, we've really scaled up the learning and the guessing process, but we're ultimately we're limited because we needed that training set, and the training set was created by people, um, and so it becomes it will it becomes I don't know it, it becomes a bottleneck at some point because it has to be provided by people. People have to say what's a picture of a cat, what's a picture of a not cat, you know, and and sure you can have the internet label lots of pictures, but still. It doesn't scale with computation. The labeling process doesn't scale with computation. So it's uh, partly scalable. And we might look for ways to get beyond that. So not so much. And then how scalable is uh, reinforcement learning? It's going to be the same answer, by the way. It's, it's going to be not so much. Um, yeah. Uh, because classic reinforcement learning, you don't have to have labels, right? You, 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 reinforcement learning, you guys know what you do. You try things, and then if it works, you do it. And if it doesn't work, or if it gives you pain, you stop doing it. If you eventually you get a good result, you learn the sequence of actions that, that led to that good result. You can learn to play uh, Go by, by seeing if the moves that you are made lead to a win rather than a loss. You don't need labels. So that's good. Uh, uh, And, and, oops, oops, that's supposed to be the, it, when, when you have the um, self-play, that's what they did in AlphaGo, they did self-play. So you play, you can make, you make your own data by playing against yourself and seeing who won. And uh, so you have lots and lots of data that way, and you could scale, so you could scale, but, but it's, there's a, there's a limit to classic reinforcement learning because uh, you just do a little bit of computation per time step. So if you imagine something living its life, uh, doing things, occasionally seeing rewards, uh, 
It's just learning the policy, the, 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 the map from state to action, and the value function, which is from state to how, how, how well it thinks it's doing. And those are two, they're small things compared to computation. Um, you have to learn like, yeah, you know, two, you might imagine them as deep learning networks, okay? And each, let's say, tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second, you do an update to your uh, deep learning network that, that gives you the policy and the value, so your two networks. Um, and uh, you, you, there's nothing else to be done in that tenth of a second. Uh, you can't, um, there's nothing else to be done. You're just learning a small thing. It's like, you know, as opposed to our, our, our minds and our, our knowledge of the world, we know all kinds of things. About, we know how the world works. We, this, is, this is not how the world works. This is, just, this is what to do and how good is the state. Okay, I think we do that. I think we have in our heads, you know, policies to say what to do. If we're in a rush, you ask us what to do, we'll, we'll read out. You know, the tiger jumps out, I'll run away. Uh, and I say that would be bad. The tiger's jumping at me, that's bad. Okay, we do that. We have that intuitive fast judgment. But, but uh, we do much more than that. And if that was all you had to do uh, in each moment, update those two mappings, it would not be really be scalable. Uh, you, ma mappings would become more complicated as you had more computation, but, but they're, that's diminishing returns. It's not really that scalable. So, so I had to prepare the slide for the, the meeting that's, that's going down in the other room, and I prepared this slide. Um, this was the question, most important advance in machine learning in the next 12 months, what will it be? Okay, they made us answer this question. For, first, I just was really pissed off at them for making me answer this question. Then I found a way to twist it to my advantage. Um, the, the leeway they've given us is uh, what's the most important, they, they, they're allowing me to decide what's the most important. Okay, I, they're probably thinking what's gonna make the most money. Okay, what's gonna be the biggest company or the next startup. Okay, and and uh, but that wouldn't be the most important advance in machine learning. The advance, most important advance in machine learning would be things we did now that led to some big, big step, and then you know maybe a few years down the pike they would come into applications. Okay, a big advance in machine learning. Okay, so this is my answer: it's the ability to learn at scale from ordinary experience. So to learn. Uh, so ordinary experience just means from interacting with the world with no labels, no nothing provided, learning in a more naturalistic way than how a child or an animal might learn. You know, the animal goes through its experience, things happen, and it learns from that. And the thing that it learns about is it learns how the world works, about cause and effect. You know, there's the kid playing in the sandbox or waving its hands in front of its eyes, looking here and there. Um, this is uh, learning from ordinary experience and to do it at scale. So I guess that means the deep network uh, with a large neural network, many, many parameters. Um, and so if we could do this, so the, so the, 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 the lot between this slide and the previous slide is that there's much more to learn about the world. You know, you wave your hands, you see all, you see a whole image. Uh, you, um, you manipulate objects in, in, in the sandbox. You see all kinds of, you feel things, you see things, you can try different things. There's much more to learn than, you know, uh, what should I do if the tiger jumps at me? Uh, much more to learn than how good is this? When you play and when you interact with the world, you learn about how the world works. You learn, you know, objects fall if you drop them. You learn how they look if you turn them around. You, you learn about space. You just learn cause and effect. All these, all this kind of learning, uh, is 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 endless and huge. There's so many things to learn. I mean, even just about your hands. You know, all the things you can wiggle your hands and how how fast they will respond. And just walking across the room, how you know about the surface, how your legs work, how your shoes work. Um, so much to learn. So much more to learn than just a policy and a value function. And so much more to learn than just what a teacher says is the right thing to do. You know, you move your hand around, you walk, you don't have a teacher telling you what to do. So, um, 
So, how are we going to do this? If you believe me. Do you believe me? I, I, I think this story stands on its own. You know, this, how the world works is, the, is the, the next big thing that we need to be able to learn. We need to find a way to learn it at scale. Say we're a robot. How to learn it at scale. Okay, so I call this the grand challenge of knowledge by world knowledge, knowledge, empirical knowledge of the world, like the laws of physics or knowing how the... So you, do, you don't, to play chess, you don't need this because you know how the pieces move. We need the analog of how the pieces move. In chess, since we know how they move, we can plan deep. We see, you do that, I can do this, he can do that. And we think it all out. We can, that, that we can plan in that way and we know everything. Um, but we don't have the analogous thing for the real world. And so that would be what we need to know. Uh, and I do think prediction is important. It's, it's key, one of the key principles to, um, to learning just regular about the world. The word prediction is used in various different ways, unfortunately. Um, and here are the top level things we need for the knowledge it has to be expressible. We have to represent all kinds of things, objects, space, people, buildings, uh, everything. Uh, it has to be learnable and has to support the planning processes. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of work on this, you know, towards this. Um, and, uh, I don't know, but I just want, really I want us today to give you I'm leading, see what I'm leading to? I'm leading to, this, to the conclusion that we have to do this. This is the thing. Uh, it's going to be hard, uh, but we have Moore's Law on our side, and we have deep learning, and there's an enormous amount to learn about how the world works, uh, but we can, we can uh, I think it can be done if we just accept that it's abstract and think it through. Question is good. Sure, this is uh, inconsistent with what you're advocating for, but if I think about intelligence and I think about what we do, when we, yeah. when we have children, yeah. we don't put them in the backyard and hope that they learn how to yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we send them to school, we encourage them to read books, we, we instruct them, and arguably those are other forms of data. Um, and so I'm not sure that that's inconsistent with what you're saying, but I'm not sure that we learn everything in a naturalistic way. We, we, we inform that process. Yeah. How that fits in. I, I'm, I'm thinking exactly that way. Uh, I, I'm going to count that as naturalistic. It's naturalistic at least much more than, uh, than supervised learning where we, you know, we, we, we really, we do this preparation thing. We get a whole lot of data and then we prepare this training set of examples. Instead, there are things that are going to happen. Now, the things that happen are not, are, 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 are not totally uh, random. They're not without aid. So, as you say, uh, we, don't, we don't let, well, I, we don't let the baby go learn about the world by playing in traffic, okay? We, we, we make sure that it's safe for him, for him to play, him or her to play. And, um, and so we are, that is, it is a case of, of providing some help, some assistance. And based on our, our providing some knowledge that the uh, should play in the sandbox and not in the with in the in the street, um, yeah. So you know, it's not those things are un, un, are irrelevant. Uh, they don't they don't scale. Yeah. Good. Um, so maybe to go back, yeah. Yeah. I'm raising it, but I'm a kitten right now. That's opposite, right where. You can actually immediately clearly has so much structure already in there that's not scalable, that's not this one's the generic learning algorithm because like immediately the letter box is it immediately like knows how to hunt there. All of that's already built in there. And it doesn't seem scalable to me. I wonder if our goal is to replicate kinds in some way, whether or not just focus on scalability will be that. Well, uh, so it's definitely both. And you know, even if we build a robot and we ask the robot to learn everything, and we still give it cameras. Okay, we didn't say go figure out how to get light sensors. Uh, any any system will always be a, a mix of both, and so so um, 
And so in the end, I think, I think it comes down to this. It comes down to what are you interested in, in doing? Are you interested in finding, making a good system? In which case, building things in is fine. Okay? Or are you, you're interested in discovering the principles of intelligence? Okay? So anything involving building in part of the answer is not really a principle of intelligence. No, even in the cat. It's not a, it's not a, a, it's not the process of finding out things. It's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, I want to get water up high and, uh, I want to study how you could do that. Well, if I say, well, let's start with the, 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 uh, the, the, the reservoir up high half full. Uh, that, that means I will fill, I'll get the water up high faster, but I won't, it won't help me in becoming better at moving water. Uh, it's, it's very much like that. So, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Um, knowledge. These are some examples so you know what I'm talking about when I mean by knowledge. I'd like to, aud- I'd like to turn all of these into totally formal, explicit things and, uh, that, that are in terms of data. Okay? So this is the data view. Um, all our knowledge is facts about the data stream. We're an agent. Things are flowing into us through our sensors. Actions are going out. Uh, so you, you we're tempted to think, oh, knowledge of the world? Well, we have to know that there are people, that there are objects, that they can be on top of each other, they can be different categories. We want to list all this weird stuff, uh, the ontology stuff, and it's not a sensory motor view. Okay, It's not expressed as in terms of sensory motor. But I want to think it's all sensory motor. That, that anything you know about the world is a fact about your data stream. Okay, this is really good um, because it, it gives you. It says that whatever the meaning is, the meaning is is is, is a statement about the sensory motor stream. Like maybe it's, whenever I see this thing, it's followed by that. This thing in my data stream, it's followed by that thing. Okay, it's a, if it's a, if it's a, if it's that kind of fact, then everything we believe. Uh, has to be turned into that kind of a fact. Uh, that means that the knowledge actually it's in the data. It's a fact about the data, and that means it's in the data. So that means you can, in principle, learn it from the data. You can try to build some of it in, but but if it's in the data, you can verify it from the data and learn it from the data, and that's where we want to be. Um, semantics. I want. I want. I really. I'm talking about the meaning of knowledge, and it's going to be the meaning, it's going to be a statement, a statistical statement about about the data stream and, and both both, in, both act, senses and actions. Um, so this, this seems to me like, um, you know, the, the key step. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm, making, I'm, going to, I'm going to get to my other slide. Uh, uh, so it's hard to do this because it's abstract. And, and uh, uh, what I want to say, so in the end, in the end, uh, what it will mean to understand the world is going to have many, many predictions. Uh, they'll be long-term predictions. They won't be like, if I do, the, they won't be like, like physics predictions. They won't be like, if I twitch my finger, then I'll feel this thing on the, on the very next time step. It'll be more like, oh, uh, I know uh, I can go out there and find the restroom again, okay? Or I know I could throw this object and it would end up on the floor and might break. Um, so they're going to be long-term, and we're going to want to learn f- about them from partial executions. I might want to learn I could go here and type, but I might not type today. I won't type. Okay? So uh, I want to think, get your mind, to help you get your mind into, this, into thinking about real experience, I put up some some videos, collecting some videos of, of life. This is the kind of data that we're going to have. So there we have some soccer players. And think about what's going through their minds. They're, they have uh, doing sequences of events. Their visual stuff is coming in. They're hearing stuff. They're, they're, they're continually generating kicks and motions. And they're, a lot of it is, is, is predictive. I think that guy is trying to figure out, you know, am I going to be the next person to kick this ball? Or is, is my partner going to be the next person to kick the ball? Um, will, will someone touch it? Or will I make this goal? 
You guys know who that is? Who knows? Who is it? It's Messi. He's the greatest. <laughs> so, so I want you to think about that kind of intelligence. Um, and or think about uh, those that hyena up there who's, who's running uh, away from the lion, okay? And he's trying to predict long-term prediction like, am I going to die? <laughs> and uh, it's looking, looking like it might not be good. Uh, but these predictions go up and down. You're, you're always, you, you do have value functions. And uh, now it looks like maybe he will get away. Okay? Uh, continual predictions of long-term things, like am I going to hit the ball? Am I going to make a goal? Am I going to, to die? Uh, not really dying, but you can't really learn from that. But, but you do have long-term predictions. You can learn from not dying. Um, he, he was getting away. Now it's being to look grim again. In the end, it, it's kind of grim. Okay. <laughs> um, we ought to also think about this, this goshawk. You know, it's, can he, can he swim through that, can he fly through that little hole? Um, so there's a, there's this outcome. You know, am I going to get through there? Am I going to hurt my wings? Am I going to be okay? And it's, it's really fast. You have to, Predict things really fast, even like like conversations. You you would have, and outcomes like is she going to kiss him, or what? So we're just moving on. Uh, uh, also, I wanted to show the baby. The baby is uh, moving around, sped up, but he's but he's interacting with with various objects and he's learning what can you do with various objects, and uh, that's what we spend a lot of our our youth doing, figuring out how the world works. Okay. Okay, so the knowledge is in the data. It's about the data. It would be cool if the knowledge could be about the, about the data and then in the data. Uh, so, you know, people can label these things as whatever they are, cats or, or houses or, or ducks or whatever. So how does the people know what, what's a real duck or what's a real chair or what's a real cat? Uh, they know by some other way. It's not like, oh, I've seen lots of pictures that were labeled cats, and so I know this is a cat. It's, it's they have, they themselves... Uh, no, it's a cat because cat means it might move, it's going to be, uh, might make certain sounds, it'll be soft, it, it'll run, it, I've, I can see it. You could, so it's, I want to say all those things are predictive. Our, our categories that the world comes in are predictive categories. Um, uh, so, so the weird thing is, I want, to, I, want, I want us all to take our ordinary knowledge of the world and convert it into something that a computer can absorb um, so take what seems straightforward to us and concrete and make it abstract. And how could we try to do that? Um, well, here's, here's, I'm just going to say a little bit more. Um, uh, the knowledge is about the world's state and the world's dynamics. So we should be looking to form something called a state, which will be the summary of the past that I'm going to use to predict. And, um, Good state knowledge is to have a good summary of the past. And a good summary is one that enables future predictions, predictions about the future to be accurate. Okay? The predictions themselves are the dynamics knowledge. Uh, notice the predictions are not simple predictions like this is going to happen. They, they, they would include things like, um, I can get this to happen. I can walk safely over there if I want to. Not that I'm going to walk over there, but I could. Or I could pick something up, or I could go to the restroom. And they're action conditional, and they're hypothetical. Or subjunctive, um, and then uh, you want to predict the states because you need a model. Um, you want them ultimately to form a model of the world they can use for planning, and uh, so you, then you want to do this all scalable. And I don't know. I don't, for to, to wrap it up, uh, I'd like to, to to make this. So, what are some of the near misses in the field? Um, near misses to uh, learning in a scalable way about how the world works. Well, this is a an example that I often give of a, of a maze. So this is a cartoon example. And uh, so you have to go from start to goal, and you get a plus one when you get to the, the goal. And we are also learning a model. We're learning that if I'm in this square number 14, and I do action number two, then I end up in square 54. OK? So it's learning all these facts about the world. But it's a miss, because it's, it's all very, it's, it's one-step model. 
and one-step models are, are insufficient, but so one-step models are a trap, and predicting by any fixed interval is a trap. Um, it's, it's, uh, it seems good, but it, it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale to, to depth and um, doesn't uh, scale to stochastic environments. And um, so, so I, 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 wanna, I don't want to go any further on all this stuff, um, uh, but what should I show? This is the kind of, the kind of uh, robot reviews, and it's learning things like uh, is it, how its sensors will respond as it moves around. If it goes forward, these are various sensors that are going up and down, and it's also predicting them, and those little flickering lights are its predictions, and they're changing over time. And, we scale this up to some cases, uh, thousands of predictions. This is this is a case where we're doing thousands of predictions, and um, and so all these flickering lights are just well. The first the, these the the lights up here are the representation of the state up top, the yellow flickering, and these are predictions about those bits at various time scales. Um, and and my friend uh, and colleague um, Patrick Polarski has been using the um, this robot arm and doing all kinds of predictions about it. Um, so that's sort of what it ends up being like. So, so to wrap it up, this is a, this is really an old goal. It's very ambitious goal. Understand the world in sensory motor terms. Finding making all these predictions, finding the right abstractions that let you predict accurately, expressing cause and effect compactly. Uh, it's well suited to scaling because you know the problem is that there's so many things to learn and so many different possible ways of behaving, so many different signals coming in. There's huge quantities of, uh, of things to learn. And so I'm making that into a, into, a pot, into a feature rather than a bug. I'm saying that means it's, it's, it's really compatible with scaling. Uh, and there are new tools for doing this. Um, some of these are some of their names, generalized value functions, because I'm thinking, so, so, so I'm thinking, I'm, I come from reinforcement learning background, so when I come to this new problem, I think, well, how can I adapt my reinforcement learning algorithms? I admit that. Now, Richard uh, Zemel is sitting there, and he said, oh, this is a new problem. How can I apply my supervised deep learning things to this new problem? And, and that's OK. Everyone should, should apply what, what, what they're familiar with and as they try to do this. And then we can all come together. Like, I'm going to use deep learning. And uh, maybe he'll use some TD learning. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and conclusions. So I need to, so Moore's law strongly impacts AI. It makes the present special. There's hardware races alongside. Scalable methods will have the longest, the greatest long-term impact. So I think the future does belong to scalable methods to search and learning. Now, uh, in particular, I think the big prize, uh, no, the, the next prize is just the scalable learning from ordinary experience, and the big prize is to learn knowledge of the world from ordinary experience. And I've tried to argue that it's possible today, although, of course, I haven't talked about the details. But I think it's possible, and it's very scalable. And so we should try to be ambitious, long-term, scalable, patient, and stubborn as we do AI research. Thank you very much. I think there's a few principles, and uh, once we understand those principles, we will um, uh, we will say we understand how minds work. We won't understand all the details, for example, the human mind or the cat mind, because we don't know all the prior knowledge and things that are built in, and or even what the goals are of the system. Uh, but that's what success would be like. Thank you. Uh, so. Um 
I'd like to comment a bit on Sheila's remark about the soldier that I said it said I'm not sure that's true. I think if we interact with our children uh except that we never did any explicit instruction, never properly classes in school, uh but otherwise interact with normally, uh I think they grow up not all that much different than they do now. And that's perhaps because they're mimicking, they're, they're being consistently taught by seeing the usually things and mimicking the See, that's an important uh, aspect of learning uh, rather than just learning. Well, of course, course, it is It is important. Um, and... But I would think that the vast majority of what we learn, we learn by, by doing and trying and seeing the consequences. And, you know, I... When I say the majority of what we learn, I don't mean that there aren't really important things that we can only learn by mimicking. But they're like numerically fewer. Maybe very important, but numerically fewer. And they're, they're, on, they're built on the substrate of this much larger amount of just learning the way the bo- your body works and the world works. Sheila? So to Radford, I guess, is, and, and maybe to you too, Rich, is language obviously is a form of data. And, and we do explain things to our children. Yeah, right. We tell them not to put the uh, um, plug of the television in their mouths and various other things that, that allow them to survive. I, I do believe that, that, and that, that we, we instruction of some sort is, is part of what we do, but I think it fits into this this view of, of data in the sense that it's just it's just more data, and it's data of a particular sort, and it's not necessarily IID data that, that is large in, in volume. It's just a different type of data. At least that's the way. I- well said. Yeah. View on that, which is, I think, like if you think about organisms in the natural environment, right? There is no language. There is no class to go through. There might not even be any terrible guidance from a reading computer. So all organs involved in the environment, where there's not. So in fact, all the language, all the instructions, all the, they are kind of part of the world of technology development. So essentially, you can have all the experiences you can have. That's where evolution takes a look. And they can pass experiences which enable data that would not that would save time for learning, because that's the heart of the office. So I think the actual instruction and language and teaching and all that is a compression of that That's part of technology, the technology part. So I think there's something wrong in there too about how to be seen in structure and convert it that we haven't really looked at. It's interesting, isn't it? There's multiple senses. There's senses in which there, the language stuff is different, and there's senses in which it can be seen as continuous. Um, but it's certainly true that many animals, or maybe all other animals, don't have as strong a sense of language as people do. And uh, yet, your animals can understand how the world works. You know, like a squirrel really understands physics and how its body works and, and tree branches. Uh, and, and they can plan and do all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so I actually think that we would be really far along if we could do if we could do the cat or the squirrel. And we even if we were not able to do language yet, it would be and provide an important substrate. Uh, so I, I, I and personally, since I'm standing up here, I'll say personally, uh, I I don't worry about language very much because I think the other things are earlier and. Uh, and that they will influence how we do language. Um, yeah. Good? There's a question, which is, uh, so one possible uh, criticism for school methods is you can't really explain uh, what it's actually doing, and perhaps you'll be able to build something that matches human intelligence, but still have no idea how it works, just like how we don't have any idea how our brain works. I just want to hear your comments. So I think that's right. That's often that's one of the reasons for for uh, modeling for building in the structure because it's more understandable. Uh, but yeah, I think we give. I think we have. To, I, I would give that up. I, you know, I like. I don't. Yeah, for other people, we don't really understand how they're thinking. In fact, we don't really understand how we're thinking. Uh, I would give that up. And I think we do give that up when we say uh, with a scalable method that's learned, 
Yeah, that's 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 the that's you know, that's the, one of the arguments that's always given for the symbolic and the, uh, the things that are oriented around the way we imagine that our minds work, so we can understand them better. We don't understand deep learning. That works too much. Okay, I see Richard's coming up here. All right, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you all. Great talk. Thank you all for your attention.